Hi, everybody, and welcome to my session. My name is Katie Garner, and I am thrilled to be here. I'm so glad that you are here and that you are joining me, and we are actually going to jump right in so that we can really knock out a lot in this short time that we have. So the first thing that I want to make sure that you know how to do is to find your handout. So I'm going to show you a couple different things, um, both the handout as well as where we can get together and carry on this conversation after session, even beyond the few minutes that we have to chat um, immediately after. So the first thing that I want to do is invite you to share on social media, because these are also the platforms that are perfect for us to follow up with um, afterward. Whether you are on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, you can find my social media links in the download packet that I'm going to show you in just a second. You can also see the links here at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll be able to make this screen a little bit bigger. If you're having trouble, I'll be flipping back and forth to make myself bigger and the screen bigger. So you'll be able to see things a lot better as we get, get moving. Um, but you'll also be able to see these toward the end of the present presentation as well. And there will be some drawings for uh, folks that reach out or post during session. That gives me um, a way to connect with you afterwards. So please feel free during session to share. Uh, the other thing that you're going to see, and you'll also see this at the tag at the bottom of the screen, because this is probably the most beneficial um, piece for you after session to really deepen and, and broaden the base of knowledge that we're gonna talk about when we look at this brain-based approach to what is the base for reading, which is fast tracking the code, accessing all of those sound symbol speech to print connections that kids need, whether they're a beginning learner and being fed them very, very slowly, too slowly, as you'll see, or whether an upper grade struggling learner is still working to um, acquire them while they're also working on on grade level uh, curriculum access. So we're going to look at both of those things in different directions. And the best place to connect with others that are in your particular grade level or working with populations similar to yours is in something called um, this Facebook group. It's actually called Teaching Phonics and Reading with the Brain in Mind. And it is a special Facebook group that is a place where you can go after session to connect with thousands of other um, teachers or administrators or district leaders who are looking at either moving and advancing readers at the earliest grade levels or plugging holes quickly for kids who are straggling at those upper grade levels. And it's just a, a gold mine of wealth of information. So I hope that you will check that out afterward. You can just search the terms in Facebook and it will just pull it right up. Or again, it's one of the links in the download handout packet that you're going to have access to, which I'll show you right now. So here is your handout packet. Now, I actually happen to have one printed. It is a chunky little thing. You do not need to print yours. As a matter of fact, yours will be more valuable to you not printed because of what's inside of it. Um, this is packed with clickable URL links that will allow you to dig deeper after session. And I'm actually going to um, go a little bit closer in so that you can see what you're looking at here. This is everything that you're going to see me talk about today, including this presentation itself. So you'll have access to this presentation, but yours has a special treat in it. It has these little yellow arrows. Now these arrows are enlarged, but each of these arrows will let you click um, and dig deeper and go down a rabbit hole that's specific to whatever the slide is about. Another slide that I want to mention or arrow that I want to mention because it's a, a pivotal piece of cheating the brain, which is the the overarching focus of everything we're going to talk about today for the purpose of reading. If you teach kindergarten or first grade or you have ELL learners uh, that are coming in from a different language background, one of the most time consuming pieces of the code are the individual letters and sounds and they don't give you much bang for the buck. So there's something called the better alphabet. And what it is, is it's a muscle memory approach to fast tracking every single possible sound a letter can make by itself. So not just, um, Y says Y, but it says Y and E and I. Not just that C says K, but also C says K and S. So it fast tracks using muscle memory so that if kids are only four years old or five years old and their cognitive processes, processing isn't up and running, this will bypass and take it straight through the back door, giving kids immediate access to what are the critical um, foundational pieces of the code, which are sound, symbol, speech to print, letter, sound connections. That's where it all starts. It's not what we're going to focus on today, but it's where it starts. So something called the Better Alphabet Song is absolutely something you're going to want to either download yourself if you work with kids who are still working on mastery of these skills or share with teachers back in your district or your school or your state that are. You can see the little arrow at the bottom. It says click to access the Better Alphabet. It takes two weeks, two weeks, not a year. 
not a year, not a letter of the week, two weeks for all of it. And they can still eat their shoe and lick the floor and catch all those letters and sounds. And I'm talking about kindergarten there. So it's not um, based upon their cognitive readiness or even their developmental readiness or their language readiness. So it's a really great backdoor route, which again is the theme of the day, but it's not the focal point for what we're gonna talk about. It's still a tool I wanna make sure you have in your toolkit. So that uh, arrow you will see both on this slide in your packet, which I promise I'll tell you where it is in just a second. And you'll also see it on another arrow later into the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you where this is now. And you've got a couple places you can access it. One is directly from the conference website because it has been uploaded as a one page handout with the link at the bottom because it's way too big to upload in its entirety. If you click that link, it will lead you to the page where you can then download the complete pack. The other way that you can always access it if you don't have the conference link handy or if a year from now you want to go back and find the updated version, you can go either to my speaker website, which is katiegarner.com uh, or to thesecretstories.com. If you go to either of those two sites, uh, you will be able to click on the workshop workshop tabs at the top and you can see an example of this on the slide and a drop down menu will come and you just click on session handout download. That's your packet. Once you click on it, you'll be able to download it to your desktop. Please do download it to your desktop because that will activate the clickable links throughout. If you try to view it in the PDF viewer, you'll be able to click through it, but you won't be able to um, to click on the links that are inside of each slide. So we're going to jump right on in now and get started. This is the starting point or the focal point. Um, and it's this gap between what we know about the brain and how we teach kids to read. Now, one of the things that I just want to throw out and let you start thinking about is how we go about this grade level instruction from the beginning grade levels and onward as we're dispersing this thing called the code. Because the code or phonics, is, uh, those are the keys. Those are the keys to the kingdom when it comes to reading and writing. So while they're just one piece of what is the reading puzzle, along with comprehension and fluency and vocabulary and phonemic awareness, phonics is the piece that if you don't have that nailed down, the entire dish is a failure. So the reading recipe that involves these other variables is it's, it's all contingent on kids being able to read in the first place. And phonics are the key to that. If kids can't read the text, they can't comprehend. If kids can't read the text, if they don't have the code, the phonics code, they can't build fluency with reading if they can't read the words on the page. So phonics is really the core key component here that we want out of the way so that we can focus on what reading and what writing is supposed to be as kids continue to move through the grade levels to access curriculum. And if we look at this imbalance of where we start and how slowly we go and why we do it the way we do it, we can start to see some paradigms shift. So I want to begin that process with just thinking about this. We tell kids, T says, T, -t, 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 -t says turtle, T, -t, -t, T. But almost every time they see the letter T in a word, it's not uh, going to say T. It's going to say T. You want to know why? It's because they don't get along. They don't like each other. Actually, they just, they don't play well together. And anytime these two letters get together, they always stick out their tongues and they say, and that's the sound they make. And they do it all the time. Matter of fact, they do it on almost every page of every book, almost every line of every page of every book. They're everywhere. And they never listen. They're like the two kids in your class who you've separated a hundred times. And yet like two little magnets, somehow they always find their way back together. That's exactly what TNH do. And the reason they're not supposed to sit together, even though they don't listen and they always do, is because every time they get together, they stick out their tongues and go, and that's the sound they make. Now, it is not hard for kids to remember that TNH don't get along and misbehave and go, just like it's not hard for kids to remember in your class who doesn't get along, who misbehaves, and what it is they do, or who can't sit together. As a matter of fact, I would make a bet that almost every kid in your pre-K class knows who can't sit together, let alone your ninth grade class for ELL. Not that you'd have kids that can't sit together in ninth grade, but you know what I mean. So when you can attach what the brain craves, which are logical patterns, ways to make logical deductions about behavior, when you can create something that doesn't exist, which is meaning, real meaning, and you can um, harvest that meaning from the social and emotional understanding and experience that kids already have before they even come into school. It's a universal understanding that we all share as humans. And it is the earlier, earlier developing area of the brain. It is also 
also the most easily accessible area of the brain. So we're going to look at how we can tap into this um, open playing field to fast track otherwise complex, abstract, and often um, difficult skills for many learners to acquire. Now, we do have to ask ourselves, though, that TH is a first grade skill. It's not supposed to be taught until first grade. T, however, is a kindergarten skill. You get that first and foremost. Problem with that is if you're a betting person, your odds are pretty slim that that T is going to hold water when you try to attack it going T, because it's almost never going to say T if it's with an H. And TH is a digraph sitting on first grade scope and sequence. This is how the puzzle starts to go backward. This is how kids stop analyzing text. Don't think of reading as a decoding exercise. Don't even think of themselves as readers, but as word callers. What choice do they have if they're given the least likely sounds that letters make first, which they are, because those are the individual letters and sounds. Now, by the way, that Better Alphabet song I told you about on the last screen, that's why it has to fast track. They need to pick up those individual letters and sounds like lightning speed because that is the base of foundation for which all these other things are going to come into play, which are what letters do when they get together and don't do what they should. Therein lies the fun. There's where we're going to cheat the brain. And there is where we're going to go next. Now, the reason we're going to go there next is because the more tools kids bring to the table, the more value they take away. So it is imperative that from the earliest possible grade levels, kids have more and more and more every day with which to work, with which to read, with which to write, because kids are reading and writing in kindergarten. They're reading and writing in pre-K. They're looking at calendars. They're, they're looking at environmental text with little labels that have their names or their birthday months. Text is everywhere, but the value that it holds is based on what kids bring to figure it out with to engage with it with, to make sense of it with. And if kids are looking at text all day long and yet they have nothing with which to make sense of it, it's like us looking at, looking at Latin all day long or looking at hieroglyphics all day long. Only when we know how to crack pieces of the code, when certain parts of that code hold familiar um, familiarity or, or um, an awareness for us to be able to start making sense of what we see, only then does value um, become attached. Otherwise, we are really going through the motions, checking a lot of boxes, but not getting much for our instructional buck, not much value. And there's a lot of time spent reading and writing across the instructional day at the earliest possible grade levels. But if kids don't bring anything to read and write with, and by anything I mean the code, if all you have is a letter a week, or even if it just takes you all year to get all the individual letters and sounds, you still can't read or write almost anything with those. So kids are really left out of the experience of being a reader and writer. And experience is still by far the best teacher. Now, if you're still not totally sure this problem, what this problem is that I'm setting up or what it is that it looks like, because before we come and solve the world's problems, we have to really see what they are, see what these big blockades are that are in the way of our early grade teachers or of our upper grade teachers who are really juggling two balls, which is working in their on grade level curriculum and context while they're trying to plug holes so kids can even access that curriculum. So no matter which area or which part of the continuum you're, you're looking at this from a grade perspective, um, we all have our battles to face if this piece, this, this, this phonics code isn't nailed down within this dish that we call reading. Now, because phonics can be extremely brain antagonistic, much more so than comprehension strategies can be to teach, much more so than fluency strategies can be to teach, phonics just is very difficult. Most teachers today have little to no um, experience or understanding in teaching phonics. Now, there are some ways that we're going to be able to take some shortcuts to make sure that they've got this bag of tools they need to make sense of text that their kids are working with. And that's the goal of this session. Um, but keep in mind that when you have a typical classroom at the earliest grade levels and your average K2 teacher in it, and certainly upper grade teachers for whom this is not their wheelhouse, they're really often working blind and they're stuck trying to make sense of things that inherently don't make sense. To try and explain or put meaning behind things that don't have meaning. It's hard to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. It's hard to explain to kids why it says yo, yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after you sing that song, you go to your calendar and the why is everywhere. But guess what? It's not saying yeah, because there are words like um, Sunday, Monday, July, January, E. That's so far. It said E. It said I. It said A. Then we've got the boys bathroom over there. And this word is yellow. 
So every time kids turn around, they see the letter Y, it can say E, it can say I, it can say A, it can say OI. To a kid, it looks like it can do whatever it wants. It just looks almost impossible to figure out. Really, the only pattern that the brain can wrap its head around, no pun intended, is that the Y can do anything it wants, but it won't say yeah. It's really the only thing you can be sure about is it won't say yeah, because unless the words yellow, yes, you are yak, good luck finding the letter Y, making the one sound it should. Now, what's an early grade beginning teacher to do? And I don't mean beginning teacher, I mean beginning grade level teacher to do when you've got this low level of developmental readiness and this monster called the code that never seems to um, coincide with what letter sounds are making in words. And you're just kind of tap dancing throughout your day trying to explain away inconsistencies or not explain them away. Just hope kids don't notice them. ELL teachers have a little bit of a harder time because the older we get, the more we question and the less tolerance we have for things that just don't make a hill of beans worth of sense. So you might get caught on the carpet a little more, but often you still get stuck with the whole, it just is, it just does, you just have to remember. Or you teach phonics skills. Either way you go, there's some inherent uh, issues as you make your way in either direction. So we're going to look at a different route. All of those phonics skills and in, in kind of pulled in, but in a backdoor approach so that it's not painful, it's not boring, it's totally developmentally appropriate, and it feeds the brain exactly what it wants so that you can really maximize your existing curriculum instruction, even something like your calendar. Imagine, speaking of calendar, that you're looking at a calendar. And imagine that you just finished seeing a song that I was talking about, which was, let's say, a regular old alphabet song, whatever you may do in your classroom, whatever it is. So you were singing, you know, A says apple, ah, ah, ah. Um, it can also say acorn, A, A, A. So you're doing whatever song you do. That's not the better alphabet song, by the way. It's not the one I was talking about at the beginning, but this is just your generic song. So you're doing your generic song. You finish singing your letter sound song. And then it's time to look at the calendar. And lo and behold, you have an A in the word August, which should be useful, right? Because you just sang, you know, A says apple, ah, 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 but it can also say acorn, A, A, A. Well, this is going to be really handy because you just worked on the A sound and now you get a chance to use it or not. Because actually, when you go to read this word with your kids, it's going to be August. Now, that's kind of problematic because if the words August... That's the O sound that says August. So A was supposed to say A or A, and we just finished doing that four minutes ago. Now within a five minute period, we're pointing to an identical capital A, but we are not saying A or A, we're saying A. And if anybody was paying attention, that's actually the sound that the letter O is supposed to make. So this is as crisscrossed and contradictory as anything that you could imagine trying to teach. So what do we do? Nothing. <laughs> we just skip right on by. You know why? because this is kindergarten that I'm demonstrating. Or maybe it's first grade. And AU is a phonics skill. And phonics skills are taught across three to four grade level years between pre-K, first grade, second grade, and hopefully wrapped up and with a bow on top and delivered to third grade, all finished and done. They're not really, especially for struggling learners, but that's how it's supposed to be. So that AU, that's not my skill to teach, not in kindergarten. That's not my skill to teach, not in first grade. Most scopes and sequences, depending on your reading series, may not introduce it until second grade, if they introduce it at all. So what am I going to do every day that we're looking at August? Just pretend it isn't what it is? Just get no value out of this? I'm standing here for a reason. We're not standing up here to just pretend we're reading words. So I can't let this go. I have to have a way to milk the value of what I'm already doing. Otherwise, my brain will leave the game. And that's what happens when we don't make any sense as teachers. When we say to expect one thing and then it's always something else. And we do this constantly with the thing called the code because we are reading and writing across the instructional day. And we give them the least likely sounds letters are going to make first at the earliest grade levels. And those are the individual letters and sounds. Kids need access to a three-dimensional code. They need more of the code sooner and they need to know just as much what letters do when they come together as they understand what they are doing when they're by themselves. So here is a different direction that we can go different way that it can look. The brain has a system for learning and it is patterning. Now I'm gonna go right back to my August example, but I'm gonna do it in a way that feeds the brain because the brain is a pattern making machine. Our brain is constantly seeking out patterns and attempting to connect the patterns it identifies with ones that it already owns to build new learning. So if what we see makes sense given what we know, we get that oh moment. And what that signifies is, new information is owned. That's what we're looking for. That's what we want. 
And all of this leads to problem solving, critical analysis, diagnostic thinking, all of the things that we want kids to engage with across the day. We don't want to turn the brain off. We want to turn it on. So if we go back just for a quick second to this August and we see the little boy at the bottom and he's going, why? Why? I don't understand. Oh, supposed to say, ah, ah. How come that word's August? Why isn't it ah, 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 That's what it looks like. Why did you just say August? We want the why. We want the why because the why is critical thinking, diagnostic analysis. It's, it's everything teachers want to engage in a lesson. But we stop it at its head when we say what we typically do when we're asked questions about why letters do what they do. It just is, it just does, you just have to remember. And then we try to give enough repetitious practice that kids just remember it. Whether it's with a sight word and we just memorize it, whether it's the word August and we're just gonna practice the word August every day all through kindergarten until it's September and then you'll forget what August is. We just do it enough times that we hope it clicks and that's not the brain system for learning. That is the opposite of the brain system for learning. We don't want to just memorize, we want to understand. So I'm gonna tell you a way that kids can instantly understand this and not just this, but all other aspects of the code. See, there are these things called secrets. They're grown up reading and writing secrets and they are what letters do when they get together and don't do what they should. So if you know these secrets, then you can figure out all the sounds that these letters are making. But they're grown up reading and writing secrets. So if I tell you one that you're not ready for yet, your brain could explode. And I don't want that to happen. So I've got to be really, really careful before I tell you one. Now, here's why that's important. A couple reasons. We're talking about feeding the brain, tricking the brain, cheating the brain, using the brain to maximize the value of our instruction across the day. Secrets are a way, an easy way, an instant way to make things important to kids. Instant and easy. So anything you're not supposed to have, you want more. Scarcity creates value for kids, something that they automatically have a universal awareness of and desire to have are secrets. So the minute you assign a secret to something, even if they don't know what that something is, which if we're talking about, let's say kindergarten here, they don't know what a letter from a number from a squirrel is. So this isn't by its face an important conversation for them. But if it's secret, all systems are on. Now there's actually a physiological shift that happens in the brain. And this is so important because it's not just a cute little gimmick, not at all. And this is just one little trick I'm gonna show you to, to mark information for memory in the brain. But secrets, because they make something important to kids, what they do is they trigger a need to know. And that is everything. You always wanna to teach to a need to know. You never wanna to toss out information that nobody wants, nobody asks for, and nobody cares. It's like throwing a ball to an empty field. You can throw it, but there's nobody there to catch it. You might hit someone on the side and get lucky, but the odds that they're gonna be prepared to grab it, hold it, take it, and use it are slim to none. So you want your catcher in place, ready to go. And secrets, because they trigger a need to know for early learners and even for upper grade learners, what happens is that marks that information for memory and prioritize learning in the brain because it actually raises your adrenaline and your pulse rate. All of the things that trigger when you're on alert and you're listening for something, whether it's because it's something that truly is important, like what's the weather report going to be? Be quiet for a minute. They're talking about it on the radio. We might have to leave early. There's snow. So whatever it is that you have a need to know heightens your state of alert. And within that heightened state of alert, the automatic outcome of that is because you've got this slight adrenaline rise, you've got a slightly increased pulse and heart rate. The, the outcome of that is a prioritized um, memory in the brain, um, a, a mark on that information. And it's like it puts it at the front of the line or tags it with a little, this is important, don't forget. It's like putting a catcher's mitt in place. So you're priming the brain for learning before you just toss out something that half your kids aren't even listening to and the ones licking the carpet didn't even know happened. So now that I've got everybody's face like this, because I told them I am gonna tell them a secret that's in this word, August. So they're all looking at me right now. And the secret that I'm gonna tell them is that there are two letters in this word August that are in love. And I don't mean like a little bit in love. These guys have a huge crush on each other and they are A and U. It's actually A and U aren't the only ones in love. A W are in love too, even though they're not in this word. But anytime these letters have to stand like right up against each other in a word side by side, they get so embarrassed that they always put their heads down and they say, ah, and that's the sound they make. Now that's really important for kids to associate a feeling to pull back or prompt a sound because kids know what other kids have a crush on each other um, or who tries to sneak a kiss in circle time. Um, so this is something that is um, 
earlier developing, earlier understood, and more easily accessible to kids, even if they don't know what these letters even are. Just like with the TH example that I gave you earlier, and you're gonna have access to download these posters, by the way, this is part of your packet um, that you're gonna download free as, as part of all that is this presentation. But this TH, they don't have to know that this is a T and that this is an H in order for a four-year-old to look up here and go, and the feeling that that triggers is the same feeling that they feel when they stick their tongue out at their friend and go. So if they want to write, let's say the word the, this just becomes an extension of the alphabet. And if they can look up and see this, then they know what to write to get the sound for the word the or this. If they're reading a word and they can't quite remember what sound these letters make, if they look up and they see this, is an easy connection. So that's what we're looking for, is easy speech to print, sound symbol connections, because that's the basis of reading in the code. So with this word, or with this A-U-A-W being in love and being August, we now have some power here. The first thing that happens is we get a nice big brain burp, because the first thing that kids are gonna see, especially kids like the one who said, why, why is that word August? Oh, it's supposed to start with ah, 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 not A. The first thing he's gonna see or say when you explain that that's because there are two letters that are in love and you just didn't know that, he's gonna say, ah, that's a brain burp. That's what happens when we feed the brain what it wants, which is a logical explanation. That's the brain patterning, something that you already know fitting perfectly together with something that you see, a pattern that you've noticed or been told by your teacher, this is the way it is. But this fits perfectly with what I already know to be true. So now those two things get to live together and I've built on that new thinking. And that's how we grow these synapses. That's how we foster these connections in the brain. So we want to feed the brain, not fight it by feeding these logical explanations. Now, having said that, we have keys now to so many more words. Look at all the words now that we can read with this one little connection. August. Or if we read the book about Alexander and the terrible, awful, horrible, no good day. There's that word awful. Or if we read in our um, one of the stories we're reading or maybe a word that we're writing in the board. So, ah. Uh, or because one of my favorites is sauce because inevitably you're gonna go to the cafeteria. And text is everywhere. And so as soon as you see that there's spaghetti sauce on the menu, guess what? Guess what your kids will be spotting and saying, oh, I see a secret, look, I see a secret in that word. And all that means is they've spotted a piece of the phonics code. They've spotted something where letters are up to something and it's something grown up and they know what it is. Sauce, your whole world becomes a reading opportunity. Text is everywhere. So secrets are everywhere, which means reading is everywhere. It just ex exponentially um, explodes your daily curriculum and content into a high value, um, meaningful activity instead of just going through the motions with absolutely no connection and a void between what kids know in kindergarten, first grade, and what they're actually seeing happening in text every single day in your grade level curriculum not upper grade level curriculum, in your actual grade level curriculum, we are all looking at a calendar every day. And every day that calendar is gonna be contradicting everything we're teaching in the alphabet song sung just before it. If we don't straighten it out and then lay a breadcrumb trail that the brain can follow, the brain will leave the game. And that's when behaviors start up. And why wouldn't they? If somebody were telling you a bunch of stuff you had no awareness of, understanding of, or ability to do anything with, you'd probably pull out your phone and start doing something too. Kids just don't have phones. They have feet, shoes, hands. They can kick. They can crawl. That's what they do in place of pulling out their phone. Now, I want to tell you a quick story because this is another way to cheat the brain and trigger attention, which is three quarters of the battle for skills to stick. Remember we said prompting the need to know? Novelty is another way to prompt a need to know so that you get that prioritized learning and marked for memory instruction in the brain. So I was doing a workshop. It was for uh, pre-K to fifth grade teachers, but I had the primary teachers in the morning, third through fifth in the afternoon. And I don't remember if it was a school or a district workshop, but it was in the summer. And one of the teachers brought her daughter. Her daughter was four, getting ready to turn five. And she didn't pay any attention to anything we were doing because obviously it was an adult workshop. She was bored, I'm sure, but there was no babysitter and it was summer. So she was playing on her mom's phone, very well behaved. She only looked up once and it was when she heard and saw me do this. Ah! And she went like this. And then she stood a little out of her seat so that she could look all the way down to my feet and then all the way back up and then all the way down again. And the reason she was looking at me is she had a need to know. Her need to know is, 
Did she just have a stroke? Is she okay? What's wrong? What's going on? Is the ambulance going to come? Because she couldn't account for this weird vocal inflection. Ah! Or this extreme body gesture because my whole body was tilted and I was till I was twisting like this. So between the rhythm and the pitch and the and the movement, she had an instant need to know. And, and we all would because again it's part of your your survival mechanism, which is to account for discrepancies. What's going on? What do I hear? What do I see? As soon as she was able to account for the fact that I was just some crazy lady doing some crazy teacher thing, after maybe 10 seconds of this focused attention she gave me, she went right back to her mom's phone. But that's all I needed. I asked her, this was like an hour later, and I actually called her up and said, hey, can I ask you a quick question? Can you tell me what these letters say? And the little girl went like this. Oh, before she did, her mom said, wait, she can't read. She doesn't know any letters yet. She's like not in kinder, so we haven't learned letters yet. But I said, this is just an experiment. Don't worry about it. So I asked her if she could tell me what these letters say. The little girl just went exactly like this. She wasn't thinking about lip position, tongue position, mouth shape. She wasn't thinking about words like August, awesome, awful. She just had a feeling that triggered and a response or a sound that came out. That's it. It was very simple. She doesn't probably even know what those letters are, but this could trigger a feeling that could then prompt the sound, which was interesting because that's what she would need if she were a reader. See the symbol? Know the sound. We've got struggling upper grade kids who practice all the time and they can't do that. Now, after about an hour, we took, or two hours maybe, we took a break toward the end and I reversed this. I put it on a wall with about nine other kind of posters, but I think I leaned them like against a chalk tray. And I just said, could you go point to the letters that say, ah, and the little girl was able to reverse the process, which is she was able to hear the sound and identify the culprits that made it. That's what a writer has to do. That's encoding. Here's the sound I need. What can I use to, to put that down, to convey that in print? Now she's able to use that sound for encoding or decoding. Not that she's ready to use it to actually read or write, but she owns the first step that you would need to decode or encode with it. And she doesn't even know what she's talking about or doing. That's how non-conscious this um, acquisition can be. Now, how will she know what to do with it? How will she know what the value of it is? If she's in my classroom for eight hours every single day and she's watching us harvest these to crack the code that is all around us, that's how she'll know. Because every single time we come face to face with a word, we are going to bring what we know to the table to crack it. And anytime she sits down and wants to write something, like you saw this little girl way up here at the top who wrote my vacation house, that's pretty unbelievable. Now you can see what she doesn't have, but you can see what she does have. And as a reader, she's got a whole lot. She knows that that O-U and O-W play really rough and somebody always gets hurt and goes, and that's how she picked one for the word house. She doesn't have enough text experience yet to know which one's correct for spelling. But if she's got that second grade skill two years early and she's already using it to read and write, she will have that fine tuned spelling in no time because experience is the best teacher, especially if you're getting it two years before you're supposed to. And every other piece that she wrote in that writing is is a testament to what the tools are under her belt as a reader, which means this is what she's armed with on a daily basis to progress through everything that we're doing in our reading series, in our math book, on our posters, on our birthday board, in our book conversations. Everything we do involves the code and she's bringing so much to the table and then taking so much more value away from that. And that is key. Now I'm going to jump down here because what I want to show you is how this actually works in the brain. The brain develops back to front. So the earlier developing area that we are talking about and targeting with this instruction is the social emotional feeling based networks. That is not only far earlier developing than are the higher level cognitive processing centers, which are in the front, but it's also um, much more easily accessible. It's an area that kids have put to constant use and good use far before they've even come into pre-K. If you have kids that speak different languages, we all have connections through these social and emotional feeling based networks. We know how it feels to be happy or sad. We know how it feels to have friends or to not have friends or to be left out, to get along with someone or not, to have a crush on someone, to be sneaky. All of the behaviors that you're going to see have been assigned to what letters do are behaviors kids already are familiar with because they're the behaviors that that, that drive, they're, they're the behaviors that they exhibit every day. And the thinking about these behaviors is what drives their decision making every day. So 
it's a very familiar territory. Now, because the brain develops back to front, and this is the area that we are choosing to target for this, uh, this content, we have to look and see how we're able to make this happen. Because in order to get what are supposed to be these abstract, meaningless, phonic sound skills to trigger social emotional engagement in the brain, we have to be tricky. We have to understand the brain science and we have to use it to our advantage. So if we understand the idea of brain plasticity, which means that we can um, circumvent areas of weakness and, and target areas of strength because the brain can rewire itself based on how, how we deliver instruction. If we wrap in a social emotional disguise, the AUAW phonic sound, with a story that says they're in love and with a, an image that shows, excuse me, things are falling, that shows the depiction of that with a, a feeling based um, uh, action that demonstrates that response. Ah, we trigger the social and emotional feeling based networks in the brain to engage. And then it connects with what is otherwise this isolated phonic skill and in the brain, they become one. So it allows us to front load the code. Even before kids need that, let's say, second grade skill, which is what that AUAW is, they will, I shouldn't say need it, before they get it in second grade based on most scopes and sequences, they will need it when they're looking at the word August or the word saw. Now, you could always memorize those words, but that is completely developmentally appropriate. And what we know from the brain science, specifically that which involves science of reading, is that that is actually detrimental when kids are memorizing more than reading. Common sense would kind of dictate that too. But when we look at where the areas are in the brain that are engaging with memorization over active decoding, we're actually stimulating um, a response in the area of the brain that weak readers show engagement. So we don't want kids to memorize words. We want kids to read them. But to read words requires constant, constant immersion in text. And I don't mean immersion as in they'll just learn through through random um, immersion. I mean taking advantage of all the opportunity that they're immersed in text, meaning giving them access to more of the code sooner so that they have more to do with when they see words on the lunch menu or the birthday board or in the book. That's the kind of immersion that does our work for us if they have have enough to bring to the table to make sense of what they see. And with these connections, they can and they do, often before they understand what they're for. And that's okay. Now, I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that in a second, but I do want to tell you about this slide quickly. The reason that we are using a story is stories are actually the fastest way to um, fill these social and emotional connections and stimulate these systems to engage. So within a story, we can give it a little shot of a social and emotional um, piece. And then through that story, it becomes easy to remember, almost like a bag that kids can hold that information in until it has a purpose to perform a function, which would be to read or write a word. So kids can, for example, remember that these letters go even before they know what a T is. As a matter of fact, they'll have an easier time remembering this than using muscle memory to grab the T. Because remember I said that the better alphabet takes two weeks approximately for kids to grab all those sounds. And that's for four-year-olds too, by the way. But that has to be muscle memory. It's like tennis lessons. It's lips, tongue, and teeth. This you walk out the door with. The minute you hear it, you keep it. And the reason is you already knew it. You already know about what happens when you don't get along with someone. I'm just gluing something new to what's already deeply understood. Now, this little girl's going to demonstrate exactly what I mean, and she's a first week kindergartner. So I just want you to listen to, um, to what she has to say. Hi, kids. Do you want to know about the secrets about these? So E-R-I-R-U-R. When they get together, they hop in their cars, they drive crazy, and they say, Yeah, so what they do, driving their cries crazy, but when you grow up, you don't do that. Okay. Now, do you hear that little public service announcement she threw in there at the end? <laughs> but when you grow up, you don't do that. Now, she took that and she ran with it. What the teacher had said in the first week of school, of kindergarten, by the way, because school started in September, so all the letters were doing what they should, so ep, t, m, b, eh, er. uh oh, eh, er. Oh, there must be a secret in that word. And so the teacher told them about he are, I are, and you are. And they go driving in cars, but they're terrible, awful, horrible, no good drivers. And they always slam on the brakes and say, ah! This was her rendition. 
she decided to take what made sense to her and turn it completely around upside down and on its head and made it her own. What better way to internalize a skill than to completely make it your own? And then she had some connective patterns to that, which involves safe driving and responsible driving. And what happens to you? If you're not a safe, responsible driver, clearly part of her experience had been maybe getting lectured, not her, but a mom, maybe her dad or her brother. Somebody had been lectured about being responsible when you're in the car and behind the wheel. And she was privy to that. And all of that came into play to help ground and anchor this otherwise brand new, totally abstract phonics skill. But now it's not a brand new, totally abstract phonics skill. Now it's something she understands and she could teach a class on it because it's really not about phonics to her. It's about something she's already known and it's kind of a life lesson. This just happens to fit right along with it, which means we get the bang for the buck of this deeply entrenched owned knowledge, even though this is a brand new skill. That's really, really, really powerful. And with that key, she does not have to memorize the word her or sure or were or circle or turn or Thursday or any other words that have that valuable key inside. That is a high leverage phonics skill and it sits on the plate in most reading series or phonics programs, it sits on the plate of first grade toward the end of the year. And I've seen a few where it actually sits on second grade's plate. That's a ridiculous amount of time. Think how many hundreds of words kids have to just what? Recognize, memorize, know, and not read if they don't have that piece. And if she can know it so well that she could teach it to your class tomorrow and it's the first week of kinder, why wait? Why would we wait? So all of these things that I'm sharing right now, this is not a program. These are tools. These are teacher tools to give kids tools to make sense of text immediately, whatever the text is. If it is fourth grade text, science text, math text, calendar text, anywhere, everywhere there is text, there are secrets. And in order to make sense of that text, kids need to know them. And they need an immediate way, not a repetitious practice based way, an immediate way to access that meaning and then let the practice come in the natural form of, now let's use it to read. Now let's use it to write and let's do it all day long. There's where the power lies. That's what makes all the difference. See it, say it, do it and feel it. We know multisensory instruction is a three pronged approach. We've often been taught about visual, kinesthetic, auditory. Feeling is actually the most important connection we can help kids make. So in order for kids to really understand and to internalize these concepts, we, we need them to have a horse in the race. We need to trigger some sort of a feeling engagement. And that is so easy to do when you are intentionally targeting your instruction to the feeling domains. That is partially why the see it, say it, do it, multi-sensory uh, approach is so, um, so beneficial. Add, feel it, and you get a myriad of connections you don't even have knowledge of. Like we didn't know how many lectures she knew about safe driving. We didn't know how many times maybe she's been in a car that stopped quick and went, Arr! she brings to the table all of her own feeling-based connections and experience. All we had to do was just kind of turn on the tap and let, let it run. So she's got connections being made all over the brain as she's retelling that story, which was clear as she was going ar, 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 and going on with her own version. That's what makes it stick. That's what shows how deeply entrenched it is. And I think that is what brings that diagram to life. The more areas that are engaged and the more widespread those areas are, the deeper the learning is. And with feelings, the sky's the limit. Now, I wanna tell you that the vows are the keys to the kingdom when it comes to reading and writing. They're, is no word without a vowel and um, the vowels either long or short. So if all kids get in kindergarten are the short sounds and they don't understand the long sounds, then they effectively are working with one hand tied behind their back. So the vowels are key and they need to be tossed out at the very, 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 very beginning. So I'm gonna show you a way to knock out the vowels in four minutes. I'm gonna tell you two examples. The rest you're gonna be able to download and grab from your presentation. So the vowels are superheroes. They have a power that no other letter in the alphabet has. They can say their name. And when they're in disguise and they don't want anybody to know that they're a superhero, they will act short and lazy. And that is the sound that they make. So for example, E will walk around and pretend that she can't hear and she's a little old lady. And she'll go, eh, eh, what'd you say, eh? And that's the sound that she makes when she doesn't want you to know she's a superhero. You pretends not to pay attention. So every time the teacher calls on him in class, this way no one suspects he's a superhero because he acts like he doesn't ever listen. So he always goes, ah, uh, 
uh, and that's his short and lazy sound. And when he makes it, no one suspects he's actually a superhero. So kids already understand about superheroes. They know they have to have a disguise. We want to be able to trigger these otherwise ambiguous and difficult for many kids to discern vowel sounds with a dramatic action. If we have a dramatic action, then they're not trying to recall the schwa sound when they make the U sound. They're just doing what you do when you don't know the answer. Uh, poof, there's a short U sound. Or they're doing what you do when you can't or you're pretending you can't hear. Just eh, eh, poof, there's your shorty. So having a dramatic action or a feeling-based cue that's gonna just land kids in the sound means they're not thinking about lip position, tongue position, or words that that sound is in. It's a faster, more direct route to grab the pure, raw sound they need to start cracking words. It's an easy way to knock out all of the vowels. And you'll be able to see the other ones um, on your download. Now, the reason I wanted to share this with you, this was one of my favorite, favorite tweets ever because this was a kindergarten teacher. She tweeted this in April. She said, we had a few superhero vowels pay us a visit this week. Thanks to the secrets, uh, vowel strategies, we've known the vowels had more than just the short sound since the first month of school. So we didn't have to wait until this week in our phonics program, but it was a fun review. Now imagine waiting from September until April for kids to have access to the vowel sounds. That would be insane. Every single word has a vowel in it. Every word. There's no word without a vowel. And every vowel will either be long or short. And that's if there's only one. So if kids don't have both sounds for the vowels, they really are working with one hand tied behind their back. Now, that doesn't mean that she has to thwart her curriculum. Her curriculum is going to introduce this in April, April 19th, in unit 10 of 10. What it does mean is she's the teacher, not the curriculum. She can give it sooner if she has a way to offer it up, make it easy. And then kids get 10 months of use from September to April. That's not really 10, but they get all of that extra time under their belt using reading and writing with this tool so that when it comes up again, she can play with it however she wants and turn it on its head. And she actually did. They used something called babysitter vowels and added that to mommy E, which is actually how kids do know whether the vowel is going to be long or short. And I'm going to show you that on the the next page. But what I really wanted to make a point of is showing how she enjoyed that she had access to give kids more sooner. She still felt fine when her curriculum finally offered it up because curriculum will have grade level walls and we need to break through those grade level walls so kids can maximize the curriculum. The curriculum is much better, val much better used and of much higher value when kids can actually read what's in it. But the curriculum is not going to give them the tools they need to read what's in it because curriculum goes front door letter sound pattern instruction, not backdoor feeling based fluidity. We want these skills to be fluid and accessible and fast tracked. And then what's fun, as she said, it's a fun review. She just took it up to the roof and raised the bar. And that's where the fun starts. Now, this little guy, I'm going to show you how he's actually going to show you how her class knew whether the vowels were long or short. He's going to explain mommy E. And this is the third week in kindergarten as the principal tweeted out, which you can see on this on this slide. So, when Mommy E tells the I to say his name and like, so it says, la, like, like, it says it's, I says it's name like he's supposed to. Did you notice the words he said at the end that shows where this lives in his brain? Just like the little girl that gave us that public service announcement when she said, but when you grow up, you don't drive that way. He said, like it's supposed to. When Mommy told him to say his name like he's supposed to. This isn't a silent E rule. This is just what you do when your mom's close enough right there and tells you what to do. When mommy E is one letter away from another vowel, she will tell that vowel, you say your name. And by darn it, he will, just like you would if your mom were one letter away, close enough to make sure that you did what you're supposed to. Now, if mommy E is two letters away, like in the word butter, she can yell and scream all she wants, but her little arms are too short to reach over those two heads and get a hold of him. And that's why that you over there gets to stay short and lazy. Uh, but utter. Butter would turn into buter pretty darn fast if mommy were one letter away. So that gives you a very logical explanation that can feed the brain about why butter is spelled with two T's and not with one. Now, if mom's not there at all, like the word but, B-U-T, well, that's because there's no mommy there. You get to be short and lazy, just like you'd be if your mom weren't right there close enough to make sure you do what you should. Now, babysitter vowels come into play when we look at multisyllabic words, which we need to even in kindergarten because words like making are in kindergarten books. Kids have to read making. They might be a biker when they go home. Every word doesn't have a pretty little E at the end to let kids know whether to go long or short. But babysitters are very easy because they just jump in when mom can't stay. And they do exactly what mom would if she were there, which is tell the vowel that's one letter away, you say your name.
Now we'll get into babysitters in just a little bit because I want to show you something first, but hold this in your head because this makes what otherwise can be a struggle for fourth graders easily accessible for kindergartners. Fourth graders struggle with the front door approach, which is vowel, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, open syllable, close syllable, long, short. You can't teach that to kindergartners easily, which is why we don't, which is why the silent E and long vowel sounds have to be held off until first grade. Kids still struggle with that vowel, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, open syllable, closed syllable, dictating whether vowels are long and short through fourth grade. And some never get it. Babysitters and mommy E is exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean you can't still teach those higher level terms. What it means is don't make that the bar that if kids can't get over, they're not allowed to read these words. If you have a way to make it easy and instant, give it to the kids because the most important thing is that they get to reading, that they are reading. Reading is a much better teacher than you will ever be ever. So the more they are reading, the more everything else you're saying is going to make more sense. And the best way to teach about, about syllables open and close is to a, an audience that already knows what you're talking about because they already get mommy and babysitter vowels. So you're just now connecting different terminology to a concept that they already have an awareness of. It's a perfect, perfect audience instead of the worst possible audience. And it's a way to give kids more of what they need sooner when they actually need it right then. They don't need it any less than upper grade kids. They need it just the same. Um, and that's why it's so, so, so important that we have and we make use of these ways to give it to them. Now, keeping in with everything else we're talking about, this is why. And this is a very high leverage phonics skill, but it doesn't have to just be a phonics skill. We can transform it into child's play. He's sneaky. Yeah, he, he found out about the superhero vowels and he was so mad because he hates his sound. He thinks y is like the ugliest sound in the world. So he snuck into the closets of E and I and he took one of each of their capes, which is, you know, where their powers lie. So now whenever he's at the end of a word and he doesn't think anyone can see him, he'll always be wearing either his E or his I cape so that he can use their powers to make their sound like mom E, daddy, candy, sky, July. When he's at the beginning of a word, though, he does what he should. Because everybody knows when you're like the line leader, when you're at the front, you do what you're supposed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, yes, you. It's only when he's at the back that he's going to be sneaky. Now, all kids know this because every kid knows that when you're the caboose, you can get away with murder. But when you're the line leader, you got to do what you're supposed to. So they can use what drives their own behavior every day to make decisions about sounds of letters in words they've never even seen before. And that's where you really start powering up the reader. This is teaching the reader, not the reading. Don't teach the word with the Y. Teach the reader to read any word with a Y. And if you're wondering, by the way, about words like day or play or they, that's not sneaky Y. That's E-Y-A-Y. E-Y-A-Y are just too cool like Fonzie, so they stick up their thumbs and go, hey. And I'm going to let this teacher explain a little bit more about that. A-Y and E-Y. These letters are just too cool. So, with thumbs up and their coolest voices, they say, Hey. Hey. Fonzie's a kindergarten teacher, by the way. Now, what that does at this point is you've established the reader as giving him the best betting odds for Las Vegas when it comes to text. His feeling now can be, give me any word. I don't even care what it is. Just give me a word with a Y in it and let me crack it. I don't need to know what the word is. I don't need to memorize the word. I've got what I need to read it. Don't teach me the word. Teach me. Teach the reader. Don't teach the reading. This is a second grade skill. Positional sounds of Y is a second grade phonics skill. That is two years of waiting that kids are going to have to have before they get access to words with a Y in them. Like my, shy, by, day, play, they, January, Monday, Tuesday. I mean, I could go on and on and on forever. Almost every third word has a Y in it. This is the most high leverage phonics skill of all. And you can toss it out in the first week of kindergarten because every kid in kindergarten by the first week knows who is sneaky. And that person probably has been told by the teacher, Johnny, you need to walk with me up here at the front of the line because otherwise I'm going to lose you because you like to run off. It's the same thinking track that can maintain that information and that lets kids go home at dinner and tell mom and dad all about who did what and who got in trouble. Those exact tracks for recall are what we're using to tie these sound skills together. Exactly the same thing. Now, having said that, that Stanford study, that brain study that we talked about, the Stanford brain study on sight words, what they did was a study looking to see whether time was well spent and invested in memorizing words versus actively decoding them so that teachers could be putting their effort in the right direction. And what they found was that the optimal brain circuits rely only in active decoding, not at all in word calling. And there were actually um, 
detrimental effects that come with memorizing over reading in involving which hemisphere of the brain the processing is occurring on and whether or not that area is associated with weak readers or strong readers. So it's, it's not only not of, of any use, but it's actually detrimental to encourage memorization or word calling over reading. And yet what other choice do kids and even teachers have when they can't read anything because we've spread the code across three to four grade level years and all your average kindergartner has are individual letter sounds. If that is all I have as a kindergartner, these words would sound like this for me. I can't read these words, but what if I could? What if I could look at the word saw and instead of saying sa I could say sa Or what if I could look at that word her and instead of going ha I could go What if I could look at the word say and instead of going sa I could go sa and I can't find the poster but oh yes I can sa What if I could look at the word they and go a what if I owned the code early enough to be able to read these words and not have to memorize them? That's where the power lies. And not just these words. Wipe these words away. Give me a hundred more. Give me any word. Give me words on commercials and billboards and road signs and menus. Anywhere there's text, there will be secrets. And every time I see them, my brain will automatically, non-consciously start decoding. That's the power. That's teaching the reader. Teaching these words, memorizing these words, that's teaching the reading. There's an old adage and a principle reminded me this of, you know, give a man a fish, you feed him uh, for the day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. The sight words, a fish. If you give him a fish, if you practice a fish, you get one fish out of that deal. When you give kids a piece of the code, you get hundreds and thousands of fish and then they don't need you anymore. That's teaching the reader, not teaching the reading. So it's a powerful, powerful thing. And this is where you can end up even in kindergarten. These are kindergarten writing samples. The, the sky is the limit when kids have access to more than just the alphabet sounds. Uh, kindergarten isn't the focus of this at all. It's just an interesting place to show um, out, outcomes because kids know nothing and we can kind of all agree that they're lost in space. And so it's the best place to show impact. And then you can kind of determine how this would look if you're working with those third graders or fourth graders. And that's one of the reasons I divide the grade levels when I do professional development. But what I do want to show you is I want to come in closer to one. This is an average sample, not even a high, because you can see from the other um, ones. And you can see all of these on the website, which are links. You'll see arrows on your packet with this page, this slide. And this will show you an entire class worth, good, bad, ugly, everything in between and progression from K to first, which is also very interesting. And then onward. Uh, but what I want to show you is an average sample here. And I just want you to notice some of the things that show us what this the student owns as a reader because writing's the best window into the mind of a reader. This little guy actually was a very smart little guy, but he had he was in foster care. Extremely smart, but no support at home. So he had no books at home. He had no home. So everything he was doing, he was building from whole cloth. It's not memorization of sight words. And that's very clear when you look at this because not only could he not spell they, E-Y, and not only did he spell C-S-Y, look how much he wrote. How odd is it to see a kid who doesn't know what the word C looks like, but yet could write this much? And he really, he wrote the word camouflage. He didn't spell it correctly, but he built it from what he owned of the code to make a word that he knew in his vocabulary. That is awesome and incredible. And it's so fascinating and so ironic to see a kid who would take a leap to write the word camouflage, but he doesn't know how to spell the word C yet. Even though his guess wasn't bad, he used sneaky Y. And that's not a bad guess. It actually would serve him well as a reader because it means he understands that's one of the sounds why I can make at the end of a word, just as, the, as he picked A-Y for the word they. He understands E-Y-A-Y says A. So that'll crack hundreds of words for him as a reader. He just hasn't had enough reading experience yet to fine tune that for him as a writer. But as a writer, he's not even supposed to have all the individual letter sounds yet. So he is doing just fine. Now, if we look at a lower level guy, and this little guy had alcohol fetal syndrome, but very involved parents. He was adopted at birth. Look how he spelled the word great. He wrote, I had a fun time swimming. I jump high. It's fun too. I had a great time and now I'm tired. He spelled the word great so wrong and yet so right. See that mommy E there? He doesn't understand about silent E. He doesn't understand that he's going to put a letter he doesn't hear to impact the sound of a letter that's in close proximity to it. That's too advanced. That's not where his brain is ready to go. Where his brain is ready to go is to understand, hey, that's mommy E. And if she's one letter away from that A, she'll tell him, you say your name. And he didn't want grat time swimming. He wanted great time swimming. And that's why he put mommy E there. 
Now it's not spelled correctly, but that's okay because there's only one logical reason that it would be spelled so wrong and yet so right. And that's if he understands the concept. That concept will unlock words for him as a reader. And then as a writer, as he reads, the word great will clearly start to look wrong quite quickly. Just like the word now. He knows the ow sound for the word now, but he didn't know which one to pick. So he picked OU. But it will serve him well that he owns that key to crack all the words with the OUOW sound. And because he can read, he will. And that helps to fine tune which one's correct for, again, for spelling and kinder. Now, this is the mommy E that we had already talked about. So I just want to jump down here. This is the babysitter vowels. We'd also already talked about that. But the reason that I want to show you that is I want to show you this little guy named Abel. He is a kindergarten ELL learner. I want you to see with what ease he can manipulate the babysitter vowels and the mommy E as he's reading through text. And I want you to just notice this because he's not calling words. He is doing what Stanford said is such high value, which is active decoding. He's not expecting to know the words. And when he doesn't know the word, he doesn't look at the teacher and wait for her to tell him. He rolls up his sleeves and he tinkers with it and he plays with it and he reads it. We've got upper grade kids who can't do what this little guy is doing because they either know a word or they don't. He doesn't expect to know the word. He expects to have to read the word and he feels powerful over text enough so to do it. And that's what's really exciting. So let's just take a quick peek. It says hibernate. Hibernate. How do you know that says hibernate? Because it, it has a yeah. Why does it say I? Because the mama E. The mama E. Um, what do these two say? Uh, Why is the A getting to say its name? It's mama E. Good job. Now, this is this is the clip where you can actually see him having to figure out words as he goes. But I do love the way that he was able to explain how he knew uh, um, the sounds of the letters that he was making decisions about in the word hibernate, because that's a heck of a big word for a little guy that is. Oh, and I didn't read. I should tell you this as well. This is his um, little background here, just so you know where he came in. Um, English language learner knew seven letters and no sounds at the beginning of kinder. Thanks to the better alphabet, he got all of them by October, which is critical because simultaneously with the better alphabet, you're teaching them secrets. So they're just rising like a flood in their knowledge as um, what they bring to the table every day to read and write a little more of the code every day they come in. Yesterday, the teacher sat down next to him. She asked him to take a picture read, thinking he couldn't actually read the word that he picked, which was um, um, the... Arthur's Halloween. And uh, then he started reading it. And the reason that the teacher was asking him, how did you know this? How did you know it said this in this word? How did you know this was A? It was because she didn't know he could actually read those words. And that's how it should feel when non-conscious learning is happening. Obviously, she's going to be doing, um, you know, assessments. But, but when things are incubating, when you are tossing out something that makes sense to everyone on one level, the application of that understanding is going to be different for every learner as it should be. Because at the end of the day, these are just stories. These aren't skills. If they were skills, they would be inappropriate to give at these earlier grade levels. They're just stories, stories that they already know that resonate with them and stories that will help make sense of what you're doing every single day, all day long in your classroom as kids are ready to follow the breadcrumb trail and connect those dots. And you won't always know when that light bulb popped on until you see things like she's seeing with Abel. So I want you to watch him manipulate the babysitter vowels because this is really interesting to watch what he does when he comes to completely unknown words. Hmm. Hmm. What do you need to do there? Is there a secret in that word? What is that I doing in that word? What does he tell that A to do? That's right. So try it again. A. Right. The. House. Look. Good job. And he actually had to switch gears in there for look and spooky. If you noticed, he um he stopped, he went look, and then he stopped for a minute and then he went sp spooky. And the secret is actually kind of like the why in that the sounds change. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but it can say, oh, oh, can say, ooh, and it can say, uh, and he had to make a quick adjustment there from one word to the other. What he didn't just do is go, look, spooky, make, house. He wasn't calling words. He was doing what Stanford said is that optimal brain circuitry occurring, which is active decoding, rolling up your sleeves and plowing through text and feeling confident enough as an ELL kindergarten learner to do that 
to say, give me some words. Let me see what I can do with them. I got some tools under my belt. I got some tricks up my sleeve. Let's see what I can do with this. That's what's really a powerful thing to watch. Not a kid who has to look at their teacher and go, I don't know this word. You're not supposed to know the word. You're supposed to read the word. And that's something you, you, you um, should be doing every single day, all the time, 24-7. Now, I'm going to end with this quick little story, um, and this is just about a little guy who couldn't turn it off, and the teacher had shared this with me at the end of a conference. Uh, he's a, a kindergarten reader, and he has Asperger's, and he came up one day, and he said, I can't turn it off. I can't turn it off. I see secrets everywhere, and I just keep reading them, and I can't make it stop. Now, he was upset. The teacher thought it was wonderful. <laughs> Because she she thought, what a great problem to have. You can't turn off the reading. That's wonderful. And he said, no, 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 it's not wonderful. I used to be able to look at words and I could just look at them. But now every time I look at them, I keep reading them and I can't stop the reading. That is a remarkable out of the mouth of babes, babes moment. So in other words, he used to look at a word like, let's say, her. And he could just look at it. But now when he looks at it and he sees that ER, he can't help his little head from going. Aah! And then because he's constantly engaged in us modeling what we do with that, he can't help his little head from going. Hur, 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 hur. And then ugh, he didn't want to read it. Unlike a lot of kids, which would say, which would be going, you know, hur, 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 hur. hey, teacher, I just read that word. That word's her. He was overstimulated. And the reason I had mentioned he had Asperger's at the beginning is if you've worked with Asperger's children or autistic kids, you know that overstimulation can be an, an issue um, and that they need to have a way to um, decompress or to kind of block. And so for him, he would look away from instruction. The problem was in a print rich classroom environment, everywhere he looked, his eyes would land on a word. And that wasn't prob a problem when he couldn't read. But now that he knew so many secrets, every time his eyes landed on a word, sounds were popping out. Ow, er, ing, er, uh, shh. And so anywhere his eyes landed, he was seeing a secret. And then before he could stop himself, he used it to then read the word. And then was annoyed because he just read a word. So then he tried to look somewhere else. And before he could do anything about it, he saw another secret. And it was like like firecrackers going off all over the place. And there was no safe place to go. So the teacher actually gave him a piece of black instruction paper that he could just stare at when he didn't want to be in danger of, of reading accidentally. So he could just pull it out of his desk and look at it. But the big message I took away, the giant takeaway for me was teach so kids can't turn it off. If you teach the reader and not the reading, you're arming them to go about their entire day reading everywhere, reading anything, and they won't be able to, to keep from making sense of it because you can't turn off the reading. You can't forget how to read. And so the non-conscious um, connections that we can make for kids with these social and emotional um, centers in the brain allows them to deeply understand something, even though it's relatively new. And because it's everywhere, text is everywhere, we are immersing them in it from the earliest possible grade levels. Those connections have a place to blossom and bloom and root and take hold. And that's where we can change the world when it comes to what kids can do and when they can do it and how we can really make it happen without years of phonics training. That is an incredible gift for teachers who have a district that can afford to send them for that. But if teachers can at least access these pieces of the code and how to make them accessible for their students, they are 90% there. And giving that head start is 90% less work than the kids have to do when all of these pieces of the code are treated as abstract skills. There's also so much value to be taken from something that can be both an art and a science and uh, ways to give teachers tools that they can then make their own, work them into their own curriculum, their own reading series, their own phonics instruction, their own phonics curriculum, whatever they have that they're using in math and science across the day, tools that will work in tandem with that and that the teachers can really internalize and um, pull into their existing pot of expertise so that they want to use them, they want to teach them, and they get kids as excited as as we as teachers are to share them. So on that note, I'm going to close and I know I went over. Um, so uh, please make sure to remember to download your packet that I showed you at the beginning. If you're not sure where to go, you can go to the website to find it, the conference website. This is going to give you everything that you need, everything that we used in session, you'll be able to download plus a whole lot more and so much more to explore. And I hope that you will also please join me in the Facebook group to continue this conversation after session. And on that note, I just wanna say thank you so much for sticking with me 
and taking all of this in at what I know was a lightning pace. I hope that you will continue to share the conversation with me and with others. And certainly I would love to see you in the Facebook group. We have so much going on in there and it's a great place to, once you've wrapped your head around all of this, follow up with me and with lots of other folks um, and, and connect after session. You can also subscribe to the email blast. And I can tell you, I don't send out much, but I do send out things that make you go, Ugh. things that either are advancements in the science that we really need to know about and then use, or ways to use things that we wouldn't have thought mainly coming from other districts, teachers, or um, principals, things that I think are um, just too good not to share. So you've got my email there as well, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, there as well as in that Facebook group. So thank you so much for joining me. And as always, it was a privilege to get to be here. So thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful conference.